الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد حياكم الله إخوة في الله والأخوات الحاضرين والمستمعين أسأل الله رب العرش العظيم أن يوفقنا هذه الليلة في هذه المحاضرة آمين Tonight's lecture بإذن الله is about a very very important topic that we are all in need of of having knowledge Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the one that grants the cure of all things of all diseases and having this anxiety sadness and falling into depression is also a marad it is a sickness and alhamdulillah our belief is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cure of all sicknesses sadness and grief we all face and depression is something that we can only try to aid we don't deny the fact that it exists and we're not saying that everything that we're going to mention here will take away the depression or is the absolute cure sometimes medical aid is sought as believers we have all those individuals alhamdulillah that believe allah azza wa jal is our maulana is our protector and allah azza wa jal is capable of all things ibn al qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala talks about principles and we should always be thankful of our scholars and even today it has reached us that Sheikh Hassan rahimahullah ta'ala passed away may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him the mashaykh the ones that are present may Allah preserve them and the ones that have gone may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them and upon our salaf we should always constantly increase the dua for them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them and gives them a bold in jannah al firdaus al a'la for indeed it is their works that we utilize today in the problems that we are facing today so before we talk about these principles the first thing that we need to know we need to face the reality that we will be tested and there are things that we will have to face because that is the part of life so we will have ups and downs we need to understand this no one is free of this because the best of us who is the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was tested severely but that only raised his ranks so if the most beloved from amongst the bashar will be tested in that manner then everyone that embarks upon his way will be tested and that is life the nature of life is kullu nafsin dha'ikatul maut every soul shall taste death and from those souls are ourselves and our mothers and our fathers our wives husbands brothers sisters and children so these things we have to face but we need to know how to do we need to have a mindset to aid us la shak wa la rayb that's the tabi'a of nafs you will feel pain but it's the manner of how we deal with it so that's the first thing i want to elaborate on that we sh- we know that we are going to have things that make us frightened that we fear there are things that will make us sad there are things that are going to be making us regretful and bring a lot of pain this is why if you analyze the quran and the sunnah how many supplications do we have if you're angry recite such and such messages ali was salam seeking aid from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protection from feeling sad of having anxiety and sadness and grief why did the messengers ali was salam seek refuge in allah from these things because they exist there are going to be things in our life that will cause us to do this so if we know 
that these things exist and Allah's mentioned them in the Quran and likewise in the Sunnah, then what we should be doing is preparing ourselves for these moments and how to tackle these things. Huzn wal ham wal gham. All of these things are mentioned in the Sunnah. So a person either suffers and has discomfort from either husn, alham, or gham. What are these things and what are they connected to? Al husn, sadness, muta'allaq bil maadi. It is connected to something in the past that brings about sadness. So that is al husn. This is what generally what the ulama categorize. And they say al ham muta'allaq bil mustaqbal. This ham, this anxiety, and being worried about a particular thing or what's going to happen, that is connected with the future. Wal ham muta'allaq bil waqi al insan hadirihi. And this ham, which is also like sadness or uh, worrying, depression, revolves around the current state. So we have three phases, synonymous yet connected to different time stages. So it is regarding what a person considers is, is the past, present or future that he will face these things. So the first part I want to bring is that we have to face these things. No one is exempt. It's a part of life. They will happen. Ups and downs, trials and tribulation, it's going to happen. And then you will feel either gham, sadness, anxiety, based upon mother, if it's in the past, currently now, or something that's bothering you regarding the future. So now we move on to the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim, his book, Tariq al-Hijaratayn. And for those of you that want to go back, it is the Fasl, al-Mithal al-Khamis, al-Huzan. The chapter which comes under sadness. So listen to the beautiful words that he mentions. Know that huzn, sadness, is that which opposes the tariq, that path that you are taking for the akhirah. Then he says, "Laysa min maqamat al iman." Having this sadness is not from what establishes your iman. Due to this fact. Allah Azza wa Jal has not commanded us with huzn and sadness. Nowhere is it being mentioned the command to be sad. And then Ibn al-Kaim he brings some proofs for this. وَلَا تَحِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ He says the first statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So do not be weak regarding your enemies. And be not sad, be not sad. You will be superior, victorious, if you are indeed true believers. It mentions, وَلَا تَحْزِنُوا The command of Allah telling us not to be sad. Also the statement of Allah, Azza wa Jal, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَمَعْنَا when he said to his companion, referring to the Prophet Sallallahu speaking to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, do not grieve, do not be sad, for indeed Allah Azza wa Jal is with us. So Ibn al-Qayyim, he goes on to mention, فَالْحُزْنْ هُوَ بَلِيَّةٌ مِنَ الْبَلَايَةِ Having sadness, it is a calamity from the calamities. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he may repel these calamities from us, this sadness from us. And likewise remove it from us. And the proof that there will be sadness here and we need to be cautious of it is the statement that he brings regarding Ahl al-Jannah. The people of paradise, when they are in paradise, they will remember the hardships and the difficulties that they had here and what they felt here. So then they will praise Allah and they will say, Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna al-huzan. All praise is to Allah Azza wa Jal, 
who removed from us sadness. So that sifa of sadness, it doesn't exist in Jannah. It doesn't exist in Jannah. And the people of Jannah will remember. Also, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say in a dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from anxiety and being worried and sadness. Ilal akhir dua But that's the shahid for us. And what does Ibn al-Qaim say? Listen to these words. Wal maqsood. The intent and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ja'ala al-huzna mimma yusta'adha min that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made sadness something that you need to seek refuge from. That is the point. Meaning that it gives you no good. This state of sadness. And why? He explains. So number one, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this something that you seek refuge from. You seek refuge in Allah from sadness. Why? The following reasons Ibn al qayyim mentions. Yada'afu al it weakens the heart and then it removes that determination it removes it and it is something that harms that will and that desire it takes it away it harms it there is nothing more beloved to the shaitan to see a believer sad just that fact itself Nothing more beloved to the shaitan to see a believer in a state of sadness. And then he brings the proof and he says, That these private counts, it is from the shaitan. Why? In order to bring about sadness to the believers. So it is something which is beloved to the shaitan. So that is the first part that you should know that when we are trialed and we're in difficulties and everyone will go through it. If you're not already going through it, it will definitely come. And we can only pray to Allah that he makes us firm and let us understand these things so we can tackle it. For indeed, it is something that is beloved to the shaitan and it will come and we need to know how to deal with it. Everyone has his own story. Whether it's finance, whether it's something to do with his wife, or husband, or children, or the state, whatever it be, with a brother, or with relatives, losing a loved one. Everyone has his story. But inshallah, bi idnillah, after understanding these principles, it will make us bi idnillah, with Allah's tawfiq, that is, with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal, alhamdulillah, will make us better and stronger to deal with these calamities. So now we'll move on to the principles. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah ta'ala, he mentions in a chapter in his book, Zad al-Ma'ad, for those of you that wish to go back, then it is in the chapter, fi hajjihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ilaji har al-masibati wa huzniha. A rough translation that is, his guidance Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the cure to alleviate calamities and its grief. Here, Ibn al Qayyim rahimullah talks about principles of how the mindset should be. When you look through what he has mentioned, subhanallah rahimullah, diqqat al faham, precise understanding that he had. So then he starts off by saying, he has mentioned different points, but I've put in a chapter heading for you to understand. So it comes under there. That the most beneficial word to say in times of hardship. The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal wa Bashiri Sabirin. Give glad tidings to the patient ones. Those when they are afflicted with a calamity, they say, We belong to Allah. And to Allah we shall return. Regarding this verse, and then likewise he brings a hadith in Musnad, in the hadith where the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
ما من أحد تصيبه مصيبة. There is not a person that suffers a calamity, and he utters, "Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun." To Allah we belong, and to Allah we shall return. And then he says, "Allahu majurni fi musibati." O oh Allah, compensate me in my affliction. وَأَخْلِفْ لِي خَيْرًا مِنْ إِلَّا أَجْرَهُ اللَّهُ فِي مُسِيبَتِهِ وَأَخْلَفَ لَهُ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا That recompense my loss and give me something better in exchange for it. Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate him and reward him and gives him in exchange something better. So that is a hadith. And we have the ayah. So listen to what Ibn al-Qayyim now says regarding this. That kalima. So we understand from here, if we have any difficulties, this is the dua and this is what we should say first and foremost. Then look what this kalima entails. I mean, we all know it, but look at the manfa and the benefit of what Ibn al kay mentions regarding it. He said, هَذِي كَلِمَةُ مِنْ أَبْلَغِ إِلَاجِ الْمُصَابِ وَأَنْفَعِهِ لَهُ فِي عَاجِلَتِهِ وَآجِلِهِ That this word, of saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon is the most beneficial cure for the one that is afflicted. Most beneficial for him in this life and likewise in the hereafter. Most beneficial cure it is for him in this life and in the hereafter. فَإِنَّهَا تَتَضَمَّنَ أَصْلَيْنْ عَظِيمَيْنْ For indeed, it entails two tremendous foundations. So number one, it is the best thing to say. The most beneficial thing in the times of difficulty and calamities. Of what it entails. And it has in it two solid foundations. And then Ibn al-Qayyim says, إِذَا تَحَقَّقُ الْعَبْدِ بِمَعْرِفَتِهِمَا تَسَلَّ عَنْ مُصِيبَتِهِ If this slave establishes and understands these two principles, then regarding his musibah, that which he is going through, he will even find some form of pleasure in that calamity which he is which befallen with. So the first solid foundation, great foundation is madha, to know. أَنَّ الْعَبْدَ وَأَحْلَوْ وَمَا لَهُ مُلْكٌ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ That the slave knows that his family and the wealth, all of it belongs to Allah. In reality, it is Allah's. وَقَدْ جَعَلُوا عِنْدَ الْعَبْدِ عَارِيَةً And he is only give it to the slave like a loan for a period. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it from him, it's merely like an individual that has lent something out to somebody and then he takes it back. So that's the first thing that you need to understand. Even though it may be our loved ones. Something that we cherish so much that we can't even think beyond it. But that particular thing in your home, your husband, your wife, your children, the wealth that you have, the properties that you have, it is not, in essence not yours. It belongs to Allah. You need to know this. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Ibn al-Qayyim elaborates upon that. He said, وَأَيْذًا فَإِنَّهُ مَحْفُوفٌ بِعَدَمَيْنِ Look at the wisdom of this man, rahimullah. He said that that particular thing, that mulk, whether it's family or whether it's money or whatever you possess, it is encompassed and surrounded by two ends of that which doesn't exist. What does that mean? So, Adamain. It's surrounded by two things which in essence don't exist anyway. And then he explains. He said, Adam qablahu wa Adam ba'dahu. That, that particular thing that may cause you difficulty or you're yearning for or want, whatever it is. Before you coming around, you wasn't there. 
you were nothing. Before you received whatever you have, you were nothing. And when you die, then that particular thing will be left and you will be nothing. So you were nothing before it and you will be nothing after it. And then he says, That which the slave has is like something that's been given to him for a temporary period, bus. And it is not him that can protect it after he has gone. And likewise, فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسُ هُوَ الَّذِي أَوْجَدُهُ عَنْ عَدَمِي حَتَّى يَكُونْ مُلْكَهُ And it's not him that brought about that from nothing. Meaning the children or the wealth. It came from Allah. It's not even those he brought it himself from nothing. It was nothing and then he brought it about to say that he owns it. Or it is his. It is mulk lillahi azza wa jal. Before that thing existed, you were nothing. And once you die, you will be nothing and you will have no control over what you have left behind. And it's not you that brought it about. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first asal. That's the first foundation. And that first foundation is what? Taken from what part of the ayah? Inna lillahi. We belong to Allah. Sometimes we cannot see beyond our home or in the bubble that we're in. Because we see our children grow up with us. We see our partners with us. We see our brothers and sisters in our community. And that's what the soul becomes acquainted to. And we get used to that. But in actuality, that's not ours. Even the loved ones in your home, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Allah. Before you put your claim on it, remember it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These things are vital. Especially when they return back to Allah, then you understand that Allah gave you that particular thing as his mercy for you. And then he took it back. And he is mustahik to do that. And rightful to do that because it belongs to Allah. The second point, أَنَّ الْمَسِيرَ الْعَبْدِ وَمَرْجَعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مَوْلَاهُ الْحَقِّ that return that he knows that his return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. And he must leave this world behind. He has to leave this world behind. And then he will return back to Allah alone. Just as Allah created him the first time round alone. He will return to Allah alone. Bila ahlin wala malin wala ashira. He will return back to Allah alone. No family, no wealth, no clan. He will return to Allah alone. Walakin bil hasanatil wasayyat. But he will only return with that. The only thing that he will bring and he will stand in front of Allah with is his good deeds and his bad deeds. That's what he will stand in front of Allah with. So that Ibn al-Kaim says, so that if he knows this is his reality, where his beginning was and what he was entitled to here and what his ending is, then he should not be satisfied and content with that which he has. And he should not despair of that which he loses. Because he should reflect regarding his beginning and his return. For that reflecting on his beginning and his return is from the greatest of cures of the calamity and the difficulty that he is facing. Deep, deep words, subhanAllah. The first point that will aid us, that we have to get our mindset in to try and help to fight this difficulty of sadness and depression is to know the most beneficial word we can say in this time is inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And then Ibn al-Kaim has mentioned the two foundations of this. And the reality is that we should not grieve and be sad over something that's not ours. And then secondly, we're going back to Allah anyway with nothing. Absolutely nothing. So that which may be causing you that grief and sadness, you're not taking it with you. But when you realize what you are taking with you and that taking 
is only your good and bad deeds, then it will make you focus more on that rather than the things that are causing you to be in that predicament. The principle is to know with certainty whatever is written will befall you. Whatever is written will occur. And that which is not written for you will not occur. You need to understand that. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, أَيَعْلَمَ إِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ أَنَّ مَا أَصَابَهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُخْتِيَهُ That he should know with certainty that which befalls him, it's not by way of a mistake. It was written. It was going to happen. And then he brings the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُسِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ إِلَّا كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبَرَّأَهَا That whatever befalls him by way of calamities upon the earth and among or in yourselves, then know it is already pre-written. فِي اللَّوْحِ الْمَحْفُوظِ Inscribed in the book before we bring it into existence. إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ And that is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, and this is the shahid, لِكَيْ لَا تَعْسُوا عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلُّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ In order that you may not be sad over matters that, that you fail to get, nor that you rejoice of that which has been given to you, and Allah does not like the prideful boasters, those who are prideful and they boast. Like in the shahid is that it is written. Written by who? By the one who is Arham al Rahimin, the one that is most merciful. And the hikmah of Allah Azza wa Jal and his perfect wisdom entails mother. From it, rahma, wal maslaha. That which is good for you, filled with rahmah. So you have to understand that Allah Azza wa Jal la yudhlimu ahad. These are things that you need to have. You have to have husnul dhan regarding your Lord. That these things are written from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is a, Allah our Lord does not wrong a soul. And that which He decrees and ordains is of adal, is just. So that is a point that we have to understand because if you understand what happens, because naturally something that befalls you, you require sabr and it's something that you dislike. Automatically the nafs dislikes that predicament. But that you have to understand that that was written from Allah Azza wa Jal. And what Allah does is fair and Allah is not unjust. Principles that if we understand that will make our problems trivial, La shak, ikhwan wa akhwat, know that um, these are some principles that aid if you're faced with difficulties. But if it's to do with the ma'asi, then we only have ourselves to blame. The, the things that we do with which our own hands that we sin, and then the problems that come about because of our sins, then the ilaj of that is easy. And that is tawbah. And to rectify. If something befalls us by way of our own sins and our own shortcomings, then as Allah mentions, it's what our own hands have earned. But that we need to make tawbah, we need to repent and cease from doing that. And that is the ilaj of that. The next one, look to see what you still have by way of blessing. Look to see what you still have by way of blessing. Because la shak, when you get hit with something, especially if it's a loss, if it's a loss of life, loss of wealth, something that you have, and it's a loss of something, then this particular qa'idah, this principle is utilized. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, أَنْ يَنْذُرُوا إِلَى مَا أُصِيبُ بِهِ فَيَجِدُ رَبَّهُ قَدْ أَبْقَى عَلَيْهِ مِثْلَهُ that he should see what he has been afflicted with 
and then he will find that his Lord has left with him something which is equivalent to that which he's lost or something even better he still has with him. So that's what you have to look at. That if you lose something, and remember this is all revolving around to prevent a state of sadness, depression. So these are things that were hate. So if you've lost something, then know and look to see what Allah Azza wa Jalla has left you with. Perhaps he has left with you something which is equivalent to what you've lost. Or something even better. And then he says, وَدَّخَرَ لَهُ إِنْ صَبَرَ وَالرَّضِيَ مَا هُوَ أَعْذَمْ مِنْ فَوَاتِ تِلْكَ الْمُصِيبَةِ بِأَضْعَافٍ مُضَاعَفَةٍ And if he remains patient and he is pleased with that which Allah has ordained, then what he has in store for him by way of reward, أَعْذَمْ is greater than what he has lost in that particular calamity, by far multiplied, far better. So if you are patient, and you accept that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reward that comes from that is far greater than that which you have lost. That he should extinguish the fire of calamity and cool it when you should look to see at ahl al masaib look at the people of calamity of what they have been struck in and the mushkila which they are going through and then he says that is something which the arabs they say that in every valley is banu sa'din meaning wherever you go there is mashakil wherever you go there is mashakil and then he says, فَهَلْ يَرَى إِلَّا مِحْنَ He will look to his right, and what does he see except for tribulations? And then he looks to the left, and what does he see? إِلَّا حَسْرَةً Except that he will see heartbreak and sadness. وَأَنَّهُ لَوْ فَتَّشَ الْعَالَمْ لَمْ يَرَوْ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مُبْتَلِي إِمَّا بِفَوَاتِ الْمَحْبُوبِ أَوْ حُصُولِ الْمَقْرُوبِ And if he was to examine and look at the world, then he will only find that someone is being trialed and tested either by losing that which he loves or by something which has occurred with him that he dislikes. And that is the state of the world today. Even though my brother or my sister, the one that is present or listening, and whatever you're going through, by way of difficulty, know that there's someone else in the world that has got a much deeper and harder problem than you. Alhamdulillah, just look at our own examples. At least we have a roof over our head. At least we have food and water, some kind of security. We have families. Just take a look now around the world. Just look around the world, what they're going. Individuals do not even have houses. The difficulties which they are going through families being massacred, children being killed, innocent lives being taken, fallah. So we should always look to see the, what we still have and thank Allah for that. Because if you look in the alam, if you look in the world, then there is always someone worse off than you. And when you reflect upon that, then that is something likewise that makes your mindset strong. The next point which I want to elaborate upon is this sadness and this anxiety that you may be feeling and falling into depression, there's a reason for that. There's something that's causing you to feel that way. Sadness and anxiety and this depression is a sickness which is connected to mother, to the heart, to feelings. So it is a mindset that you have to deal with. And it normally occurs because of a reason. There is something that has caused that. So Ibn al kaim then he says, That if a person has this anxiety and sadness, there is something that has caused that. But if you go into that state, 
it will not make it go away. So there is something that's caused you to be in that state. But then if you then suffer from extreme anxiety and sadness and depression, it won't help the cause. It won't make it go away or bring it back. It will only increase it, meaning the problem that you're in. And in essence, Ibn al qaymi says, وَهُوَ فِي الْحَقِيقَةِ مِنْ تَزَايُدِ الْمَرَضِ And reality, this depression and sadness, it only mother increases you in sickness. It's a deadly killer. That's what you have to understand. Because whatever predicament that you're in, if you allow it to grow, it is something that will bring about sicknesses. And sometimes in some circumstances, if you become weak and you're the main person of the family, that they look for support and you are totally in that state and then you fall into either depression and then sicknesses come as well, then what about your loved ones, the ones that need you? So these are all matters that we have to consider. That it is something that increases sicknesses. Alhamdulillah, the next point I want to mention is to lose a reward of sabr is far greater than the calamity itself. This is just to make you understand what we're about to talk about. So now it's Ibn al qayyims words. He says, He said, to know, to lose the reward that comes about with patience and accepting. And that patience and accepting, it is mother, it is rahma, it is mercy from Allah, it is guidance. Because that's what it entails when you're patient and when you have istirja. Istirja is to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un. So he said that if you are not patient and you do not accept and submit to what has taken place, then losing the reward of that comes with that, a'zam min al-musibah bil fil In reality, that is far greater than the affliction. So, to make you understand again, my brother and my sister, something occurs. And instead of you being patient and accepting and remaining upon ta'a and obedience, patience is out the window. And you lose the reward that would have come about by being patient. So that reward that you are going to now lose is even greater than the calamity that you've been afflicted with far greater so what does that tell us we tackle and we face every calamity that we are inflicted with patience with istija to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un with the belief that with that Allah will replace us with something better and we remain patient and we don't lose the reward because perhaps from the wisdom of Allah, he has put you in that predicament to raise your ranks. But if you do not take the correct steps, you lose that opportunity. And Ibn al-Kaim says, losing that opportunity, my brother and my sister, is far severe than that particular thing that you have been inflicted by. The next one. The evil effects that comes about of jaza. Jaza is a comprehensive word which covers anxiety, sadness, grief, sorrow. All of that it covers. So this jaza, what happens if a person indulges in this? So Ibn al kaim says, no, that al jaza yushmitu aduwahu. So when an individual, let's say something happens to him. And then he lets this jaza overwhelm him. So then he goes into a deep state of sadness, depression. When he's in that state, the following things occur. Number one, his enemies will rejoice. They will rejoice. That's number one. And that's true. Look at your enemies. Everybody knows. Everybody has them. And what is the most beloved thing for them? is to see you in a very, very bad, depressive state, sad state. 
it makes them happy because they have hatred for you. And we seek refuge in Allah from their evil. Ameen. Number two, you sought sadiqahu. Because he's in that state, it even affects his friendship. His true companions that are good with him, even he is, it affects that friendship. Because he's in such a gloomy and down state, he doesn't even want to be with his companions. He doesn't even want to be around his friend. So he even affects his friendship because of the state that he's in. That's a major one. When he goes into that state, he angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He angers his Lord. And likewise, it makes the shaitan very happy. Who is an open enemy to mankind. He likewise rejoices and becomes very happy. And then he is stripped of the reward. Which reward are we talking about? Sabr. He's stripped of it. It's gone. Taib. وَيُضْعِفُ نَفْسَهُ And he becomes weak within himself. He becomes weak. But if he remains patient, وَاحْتَسَبْ If he remains patient and he seeks that reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what will happen? Then it will wear off his shaitan. And he will repel him away. He will repel away the shaitan. And will make him become discarded, low. So this is now when he remains patient. He will repel away the shaitan. Make him debased. Likewise, he will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, his companion. That relationship with his companion. And mother was sa'adu wahu, and he will annoy and displease his enemy. Look at Subhanallah, the downfalls and the benefits. Just if you're in a particular state. So this is why Subhanallah, it's imperative that we understand these principles. So we alhamdulillah don't lose out. Because what you have to understand is, as we mentioned in the khutbah as well, Perhaps you may dislike a matter, but it's good for you. Perhaps you may like an affair, but it's bad for you. Allah knows and you do not know. So if that is established, we do not know where the good and the bad can come from, then alhamdulillah, it doesn't mean that every single difficulty that we face is a bad thing. It may be that Allah is testing you. The one that was most tested from all of us was the Prophet. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ashaddu nasu bala'an al-anbiya. The most ones that were tested are the Prophets. Then those like them and then those like them. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, I have never seen anyone in more agony than the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the time of death. But all of this is mother when he was questioned, is to raise the ranks. So not every difficulty and hardship is something that's bad. That's what we have to understand. And even though it may be difficult, we utilize whatever Allah has given us and the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order to deal with that difficulty, in order to make the best possible situation from it, and make something which is a difficult situation become something which is better for us. And our mizan. Now, the reward of sabr is far greater and sweeter than the affliction. So the reward of sabr is far greater and sweeter than the affliction or the calamity itself. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah ta'ala, he says, أَنْ يَعْلَمَ أَنَّ مَا يُعْقِبَهُ sabr وَاحْتِسَابْ مِنْ لَذَّةِ وَمُصِرَّةِ أَضْعَافُ مَا كَانَ يَحْسُلُ لَهُ بِبَقَاءِ مَا أُصِيبُ بِهِ وَلَوْ بَكِيَ عَلَيْهِ Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, to know that the outcome of patience and seeking that reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far sweeter. And it is something that will bring about pleasure. Much more sweeter and brings about much more pleasure 
then what? The yahsal al bi baqai. If, for example, that particular thing was to remain. So here he's referring to a calamity that something has been taken away from you. So Ibn al Qayyim is saying that if you remain patient and seek Allah's reward in something which has been taken away from you is far greater and sweeter than if that thing was to even remain with you. So perhaps something which is causing you discomfort of what you've lost. But if you're patient and seeking the reward of what you've been trialed with, of what you have lost, is far sweeter and better pleasure than if that particular thing wasn't even taken from you in the first place, if it remained with you. Taib, wa yakfiq. And then Ibn al-Kayyim, he talks regarding a hadith, we'll mention his words first and the hadith after. He says, to give an example, wa yakfiq. It's sufficient to know. He says, min thalik baytul ham. He gives an example of, for example, if something is taken away from you, but you seek Allah's reward, then that there is far sweeter and better than what has been taken away from you. Then he brings an example. He says, Bayt al-Hamd, the house of praise. That which has been built for him in paradise. And it is something because of his praise and him saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. What he's referring to here is, he didn't bring it, but I'll bring you the hadith. What he's referring to is the following hadith. But when he talks about Bayt al-Hamd, he's giving you an example. The hadith of Abi Musa, and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, إِذَا مَاتَ وَلَدَ الْعَبْدِ The hadith where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, when a man's child dies, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ لِلْمَلَائِكَتِهِ Allah Azza wa Jal will say to his angels, Qabattum walada abdi. You have taken the soul of the child of my slave. For yaqulu na'am. And then they will say, yes. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, For yaqul, Qabattum thamarata fuwadihi. You have taken the fruit of his heart. For yaqulu na'am. And then he will say, yes. Or they will say, yes. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Mada qala abdi? So what did my slave say? And we can only reflect and think about our brothers and our sisters who have lost their children. For that is from one of the greatest trials that a person can go through. A mother and a father to see their child, their son, or their daughter that they've raised, lived with, seen happiness, all of a sudden taken back by Allah. Because the norm generally is the children die after the parents. But every now and then from Allah's wisdom, they are trialed. And that is not an easy trial, my brothers and my sisters. But listen to this hadith of how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So when this child is taken, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, what did my slave say? فَيَقُولُونَ حَمَدَكَ وَاسْتَرْجَعَ He praised you. And then he said, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Then Allah azza wa jal then will then say to the angels, أُبْنُوا لِعَبْدِ بَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَسَمْهُ بَيْتَ الْحَمْدِ Build for my slave a house in paradise and call it the house of praise. Rawahu Tirmidhi wa Hassanahu Shaykh al-Bani rahimullah. So this is what Ibn al-Kayyim is referring to. When he says, Yakfikum bayt al-hamd. Sufficient for you is the house of praise. So then Ibn al-Kayyim then goes on to mention, فَلْيَنْظُرْ And then he should look. Then he should look. What is the greater of the two calamities? Is it Musibatul Ajila? Is it what he is going through now? Or is it Musibatul Fawat Baytul Hamdfil Janda? Or is it that he will lose getting that Baytul Hamd in Jannah? If he's not patient 
and seek the reward with Allah. So Ibn al kaim now he's saying that what is A'zam? What is the greater musibah? Losing someone that Allah has given you that belongs to Allah. If you act upon the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you, following the sunnah, die upon that, and with Allah's mercy, then you'll be united with the one that you have lost, bi idhnillah, with the permission of Allah. So what is greater? Bayt al-Hamd, also as a side note, the ulama, when they explain this hadith, they say, you know like you have a hadith that mention that whoever builds, مثلا, a masjid for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will build a house for him. Whoever builds such and such or does um, certain amounts of raka, shall I say, you will have a house in Jannah. Bayt al-Hamd is from one of the greatest houses that you can have in Jannah. Because it is a house of praise. It's from one of the greatest houses that a person can have in Jannah. Bayt al-Hamd. That principle that we utilize is that we look. That what it is that causing us the problem. What is, what have we been inflicted by? And then we look. And we remain patient and deal with it and seek Allah's reward. And know it is easy to explain or, and translate the words of the ulama. So we can understand. But acting upon this is a whole different ball game. It ain't easy. But the only thing I can comfort myself and my brothers and my sisters is that the promise of Allah is true. The promise of Allah Azza wa Jal is true. And, and remember, even if the other people cannot see what you're going through, nothing will slip Allah Azza wa Jal. Every pain. Every difficulty that you remain patient upon, then know that that is registered with Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal, la yukhliful mi'ad. That when you come on that day, it will not go to waste. Because from the perfect wisdom of Allah, everything will be recollected. And you will receive everything in detail and in full with Allah. That is something which you have to understand as well. On the day of judgment, the people will wish that they had hardship and trial. Can you believe that? That on the day of judgment, when the people will see the people of sabr, wahtasabu, remain patient and sought their reward with Allah. And what they went through, on the day of judgment, they would wish that Allah put them to trial here. Why? Because of the reward that they will receive. Listen to this hadith. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يود الناس يوم القيامة أن جلودهم كانت تقرض بالمقاريض في الدنيا لما يرون من ثواب الأحل البلاء لا إله إلا الله هذا حديث صحه شكل باني رحم الله. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the people on the day of judgment, they would have want, they will want their skins, they would want to have had their skins cut into pieces with scissors in this life by way of a trial and, and difficulties. Why? When they see the reward of the people of Ahl al Bala, those people that were trialed, those people that went through calamities, when they see the reward which they are getting, then they would wish that they had. Their skins cut in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal by way of trial in this life. Also, some of the Salaf, they would say, Lola Masaibud Dunya, La Waradna Al Kiyama, Mafalis. If it was not for the afflictions of this life, we would arrive on the day of judgment bankrupt. What does that mean? Meaning that the reward that you carry from these difficulties and these hardships. The reward of that, that you come, alhamdulillah, you have some weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have something to cash in. And if we didn't have this, then Salaf would say that would even arrive on Yawm al qiyam and we'd be bankrupt. So once again, not every hardship is something or every difficulty that you will face is something that it necessitates, that it's a bad thing. All depends on how you deal with it. My brother and my sister. Also, nothing can replace Allah 
or exchange his place. Ibn al-Qayyim says, min ilajiha, an yarawih kalbahu bi rohi rajail khalafi min Allah. Fa innahu min kulli shay'in iwad illa Allah. Fa ma min iwadun. That a person should relieve his heart by having hope that Allah will compensate him thereafter. For everything, indeed everything, can be exchanged and replaced. Except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing that can replace Allah. So the first part here, what Ibn al-Kaim is trying to say is that relieve your heart. Know that Allah Azza wa is ever living, Hayyul Qayyum. And Allah Azza wa is capable of replacing what you have lost. Everything can be replaced. The only thing that cannot be replaced is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Ibn al-Qayyim brings some beautiful words to make you reflect about the slave of how he should have that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if you lose that relationship, you're doomed. He says, مِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِذَا ذَيَعْتَهُ إِوَضٌ Everything that you lose can be replaced. وَمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ إِنْ ذَيَعْتَهُ إِوَضٌ But if you lose your Lord, then there is no replacement to your Lord. How can you lose your Lord when you turn away from Allah's ways? You turn away from His commands, from His path. And if you lose that, then you're doomed. Next one, that the reward lies with being patient at the first stroke of the calamity. That when we say remain patient, the patient is when you choose to be patient. Not that you're forced to be patient. So, you should be patient at the beginning of the calamity, when it first comes, you should adapt and be patient at that time. Not afterwards where you're muttar, where you're compelled. Ibn al-Qayyim regarding this, what does he say? These are the words of Ibn al-Qayyim now. أَن يَعْلَمَ أَنَّهُ وَإِنْ بَلْغَ فِي الْجَزَعْ غَايَةُ فَآخِرَهُ أَمْرُ إِلَى صَبْرِ اضْطِرَارِ Know that if he is overpowered with jaza, meaning that if he allows his um, sorrow, sadness, anxiety to overpower him and he takes it over, then know that his final affair, that finally the, uh, he has to be patient anyway. He has no choice. So if he allows himself to be overpowered with sadness and he's, he's not exercising patience, eventually he will have to. What does this mean? Let's say, for example, you've lost a loved one or you've lost some wealth, you've lost your house or something and you don't remain patient on it, but it's gone. Over time, you'll have no choice but to get used to it and accept it. Because it's not coming back. So then you accept the situation over time. So, but Ibn al Kaim says if that's the case, but if he doesn't accept it in the beginning, lets his feelings overpower him, and then later on he has no choice but to accept it. He's lost out. That's not praiseworthy. And he's lost out on the reward. This is why Ibn al Kaymi says, Ba'd al they would say, Al Aqil. Beautiful words. Wallah, you never ever get tired with the kalam of the Salaf. This is why I mentioned in the khutbah, and I mentioned it again for those who wasn't present or didn't hear. Our Mashaykh from the Mashaykh Rabbi always advise to read the books of Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah. And likewise, Ibn al-Qayyim, filled with benefits. Here, al-Aqil, the one that has intellect. يَفْعَلْ فِي أَوَلِ يَوْمٍ مِنَ الْمُصِيبَةِ مَا يَفْعَلُهُ الْجَائِلْ بَعْدَ الْعِيَامِ So the one who has intellect, 
on the first day of the calamity, what he does on the first day of the calamity, the ignorant one does many days after. So the aqil, so the one that has intellect, on the first day of the calamity, the way he reacts, the way he is patient, how he carries out his actions, then the jahil, the ignorant one, does that way after, days after. And this also goes to show, based upon the hadith, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith Anas, radiallahu ta'ala an qal, qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-sabru inda sadamatil ula. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also emphasized on this in the hadith, and he said, the real patience is at the first stroke of the calamity. That's what you call patience. So, brothers and sisters, whenever something happens, exercise patience. Mention the words of Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon awala lahva from the very beginning. Remain patient from the very beginning and seek the reward with Allah. Not that you turn green. Not that you cause facade and batch things up and everything. Then afterwards, after a fatra, then you start to act how what you should be doing. Just as Ibn al-Qayyim says, the aqil awal al The one with intellect, the one with faith and iman at the beginning. That's real patience. That's what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa described as real patience. And look how fine the matter is. It could be that two individuals are doing the same actions way after. But one receives reward and the one doesn't. Because the one acted at this first lahva. And the other one didn't react on the, on the same um, principles and left it. Until the affair caught him up and he had no choice. So not only is he still in the same predicament, he receives no reward for it. The next one, the best cure, best type of medicine is this. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says... أن يعلم أن أنفع أدوية له موافقة ربي وإلهه فيما أحبه ورضي له. Ibn al-Qayyim he says that the best cure, the best medicine, is that the slave is in agreement to his lord in that which his lord loves and what his lord likes for him. Meaning. That Allah has decreed this, and Allah loved that for him, so he must also be pleased with that. For indeed, the trait and that quality is that you are in agreement with the one that you claim to love. So the one that claims muhabba. So the one that claims, فَمَنِ الدَّعَى مُحَبَّةَ مَحْبُوبٍ ثُمَّ سَخِتَ مِنْ For the one that claims to love the one that he is loving, and then afterwards he's annoyed, dissatisfied, and then he loves that which his Lord would dislike. مَا يُسْخِطُهُ So he's not happy for what his Lord wants, the one that he's claiming to love, but in reality, he's annoyed with that and he's not satisfied. And then it is more beloved to him to carry out and to do those things which will anger the one that he loves. And if that's the case, فَقَدْ شَهِدَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بِكَذِّبِ Then he has bear witness upon himself regarding the lies. Meaning, he cannot love Allah. He cannot claim to love Allah when he is not pleased with what Allah is pleased with and what Allah has pleasure with. But rather, to solve the problem, مثلاً, he does something which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, then if that's the case, he bears witness upon his kathib. What kathib is it? About him loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, loving his Lord. And then Ibn al-Qaim, he says, تَمَقَّتْ إِلَى مَحْبُوبِهِ and that he has done that which disgusts the one he claims to love. And Abu Darda, radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, Inna Allah idha qada qada'an 
أحب أن يرضى به Abu Dardar رضي الله تعالى عن he says that when Allah Azza wa Jal ordains an affair it is beloved to him طيب if the creation is pleased with it that is what is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he ordains something of his perfect wisdom he loves it when the creation is pleased with it next one the one that is testing you is the most merciful and best of judges subhanallah utilizing all of these principles if we can implement these in our lives and khalas what mushkila do we have so the one testing you is the most merciful and the best of judges ibn al kaim he says an ya'lam anna alladhi ibtalahu biha ahkam al hakimin wa arham al rahimin no that the one that has put him to trial he is the best of judges and he is the most merciful وأنه سبحانه لم يرسل إليه بلا ليحلكه به and know that he Allah سبحانه وتعالى did not send down this calamity in order to destroy him that is not the intent you should know that this has not come down to destroy him ولا يعذبه and neither to punish him neither to, neither to punish him or to destroy him but rather la liyamtahinu sabrahu wa radaa anhu wa imanu but rather to test his patience and to see if he will be pleased and to test his iman and then look at some of the things that ibn al kaim then after goes on to mention li yasma'a tadarruhu so in order that allah may hear the humility of his servant and to hear his servant's supplication and to see his servant in a discarded state afflicted maksur al qalb bayna yadayh and he is heartbroken standing in front of allah azza wa jal rafi'an qasasu shakwa ilayh heartbroken standing in front of allah raising his complaints to allah and his stories of what has happened to him complaining to allah for indeed allah is the best one to turn to in these times and indeed allah loves when he sees his slave returning back to him in order to bring the relief and to bring the makhraj and the nasr and the aid so remember allah is the one best of judges and likewise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful he hasn't sent this to destroy you but rather to make you wake up rather to make you reflect how many of us have had difficulties and at that time we turn back to allah how many calamities has made us fix up in reality how many times was we ne- neglectful of getting up at night and praying in the last third of the night until bang something happens then alhamdulillah that makes us wake up at night and have that opportunity to pray to allah when the supplications are answered how many times have we been neglectful of the masajid but as soon as something hits us we're back in the masjid in the lessons with the jamaah So these are all something that Allah wants khair for us. The next point is to repel diseases like pride, self-amazement and arrogance, the hardening of the heart. So sometimes you get put in that predicament so you can be humbled. So you are kept away from diseases that may destroy you, like having pride and self amazement and arrogance or making your heart become hard ibn al qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he says an ya'lam annahu lawla mihnatu ad-dunya wa masa'ibha la asaba al-'abd min al-adawi al-kibr wal-'ujub wal-far'ana wa kaswatu al-qalb no had it not been for the trials of this life and the tribulations that we are afflicted by 
that the slave is afflicted by, then what would have happened? The diseases, the illnesses of kibr, of having pride, ujab, self-amazement, arrogance, and the hardening of the heart would come about. And then Ibn al-Kaim, he says, مَا هُوَ سَبَبْ حَلَاكِهِ عَاجِلَةً وَآجِلَةً that are, are the reasons for his destruction in this life and the hereafter. So you see, look at the hikmah, look at the wisdom. That something may come so you can wake up. So you can stop doing that particular thing that you are doing that will cause you destruction. In this life and in the hereafter. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings something about so you can wake up. And you can reflect and stop that. So you are prevented from having these sifats and these things that you're indulging with that may well destroy you in this life and in the hereafter. Absolutely beautiful words. Rahimullah ta'ala. The next one. To know the bitterness of this world is in actuality the sweetness in the hereafter. That's just to make you understand what's about to come. So he says, Ibn al-Qayyim, أن يعلم أن المرارة الدنيا هي بعينها حلاوة الآخرة To know that the bitterness of this life, what does he mean by bitterness? Trials, difficulties, because it's bitter, person doesn't like it. So the bitterness of this life is in actuality the sweetness of the hereafter. Allah yukallibuha. Allah will turn it around. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Halawat dunya the sweetness of this life, here bi'ainiha mirarat al akhirah The sweetness of this life is in fact the bitterness of the akhirah. And what does he mean by that? Let me elaborate a little bit. What does he mean by the sweetness of this life? You said, you've, you've said what the bitterness is. What's the sweetness of this life? Huh? No, no, no. He's saying here, الحلاوه الدنيا بعينها مرار الآخرة. The sweetness of this life is in 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 actuality the bitterness of the akhirah. So what's he referring to halawa to here? Not just easy life. The sweet majority of the things which are sweet, which the nafs leans to in this life, is maasi. That's the way it is. The desires. We lean to our desires. And the desires in that small lahva is sweet, seems sweet. And that thing that you think is sweet, in actuality, that sin, shall we refer, in the akhirah is bitter. It's going to be bitter mother because of the adab that is connected to it. The punishment that is connected to it. So, Ibn al-Kaim, then he goes on to say, لِأَيَنْتَقِلَ مِنْ مِرَارَةِ الْمَنْتَقِ إِلَىٰ حَلَاوَةِ الدَّائِمَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ He said, to move from the bitterness of this world to the sweetness that is eternal. خَيْرٌ لَهُ It is better for him. من الْأَقْسِ Then, the opposite. So, to have bitterness here, to be patient and to be firm in the mantaqa, in the place that we are now, to be patient upon that and to have bitterness, meaning the trials and the, and the hardship, is better to have that in order to return to an abode which will be so sweet and eternal. Ibn al Kaim said that is better for you. فَإِنْ خُفِيَ عَلَيْكَ هَذَا Even if this matter is not clear to him and is hidden to him, meaning that لا يدرك, he doesn't realize that, but it is better for him. وقول الصادق والمصدوق. The statement of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, الصادق والمصدوق, when he said, حفت الجنة بالمقارح وحفت النار بشحوات. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, Paradise is surrounded by adversity, hardship, bitterness, and the hellfire is surrounded by desires. Meaning that what gets you into Jannah is the adversities, the difficulties and the hardships, but you remain patient. You fight your nafs. But the hellfire 
is surrounded by desires because you allowed your desires to dominate you. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. And we pray that he keeps us firm and forgive us of our shortcomings. But the qa'idah is here, what, which is established in the hadith. Paradise is surrounded by adversity and hardship, bitterness. And the hellfire is surrounded by desires. And then listen to what Ibn al-Qaim, then he goes on to mention. وَفِي هَذَا الْمَقَامِ تَفَاوُتْ عُقُولَ الْخَلَائِكِ Regarding this station of what we have just mentioned, knowing these principles that we have mentioned, the intellect of the creation varies. وَظَهَرَتْ حَقَائِكَ الرِّجَالِ فَأَكْثَرُهُمْ آثَرَ الْحَيَاةِ الْمَنْطَقَةِ أَلَى الْحَلَاوَةِ الدَّائِمَةِ أَلَتِ لَا تُزُولِ He said, so the intellect and the minds regarding this, so the minds, they vary. They're in different stages in regarding what? Understanding the bitterness and the sweetness. This life and the hereafter. It varies. But it is apparent that the majority of mankind, they have favored the sweetness, halawatul mantaqa. They have favored the sweetness of this mantaqa, of this life. Ala halawatul da'ima. They have favored it over the eternal sweetness of that which will never perish. Allahumma sta'an. May Allah never make us from them. Ameen. وَلَمْ يَحْتَمِ الْمِرَارَ سَاعَةَ لِحَلَاوَةِ الْأَبَدِ And he could not hold himself for a brief moment from withholding from that sweetness in order for him to have that sweetness of eternally. He could not hold himself. He could not hold himself with the bitterness of this life for a brief moment to have eternal sweetness. وَلَا ذَلَّ السَّاعَةِ And he wasn't even humble enough to low himself in obedience to Allah. سَاعَةِ لِعِزَّةِ الْعَبْدِ In order for him to have eternal honor. وَلَا مِحْنَ السَّاعَةِ And he could not even be patient with a brief trial and test and calamity. لِعَافِيَةِ الْعَبْدِ For the well-being of of something which will never perish, which was eternal. Deep words, hard for me to even bear myself to even utter this. For indeed we fall short. We fall short, Allah musta'an. But reflect on what Ibn al-Qayyim is saying. Wallahi, just this passage, if we only took this, it would have been sufficient for us this evening. That unfortunately the majority of us, we favor that brief sweetness of this life over a sweetness which is eternal. And we cannot even humble ourselves to be obedient to Allah, not even a moment, in order to be from those who are honored forever and eternally. We cannot hold ourselves with a small trial. We fail. And then we lose of having that well-being, al-abad, of eternal well-being in Jannah. Allahu musta'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our shortcomings. And we'll finish off inshallah with one more thing from Ibn al-Qaim from his book Al-Fawaid which is relevant to the last point. Min anfa'al ilaj ta'atillah From the greatest of cure is to be, be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is now in the Kitab Al-Fawaid the Ibn al-Qayyim. For those of you that want to go back to it it's in the fossil Karahatul Abd wa Muhabbatu. That which the slave dislikes and loves. It's in that chapter. It comes under there. Ibn al Qayyim he says, فَأَنْفَوْا أَشْيَاءِ لَهُ عَلَى الْإِطْلَاقِ تَعَتُ رَبِّهِ بِظَاهِرِهِ وَبَاطِنِهِ The most beneficial things for him, meaning the slave, absolutely nothing better than this, is the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. Apparently, I went within. And the most harmful things to him were and the one that will harm him the most and is most detrimental for him is being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and if he establishes the obedience of Allah له, and he is sincere with it everything that passes him by of that which he may dislike will be better for him anything that he faces and comes by his way if he meets it with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishing the ubudiyah and he is sincere and if he reaches that maqam that station then everything which passes by which he may even dislike khairun la is better for him ولكن إذا تخلى عن طاعته وعبوديته فكل ما هو في محبوب هو شر له. But if he turns away and leaves off the obedience of Allah and the ubudiyah of Allah subhanahu wa taala, then everything for كل ما هو فيه من المحبوب, everything that he has and that he is in by way which he loves, هو شر له. It is evil for him. It is evil for him. فَمَنْ صَحَّتْ لَهُ مَعْرَفَةُ رَبِّهِ So whoever establishes and knows his Lord وَالْفِقْ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ and has the fiqh and understanding of Allah's names and attributes أَلِمَ يَقِينًا then he would know with certainty أَنَّ الْمَقْرُوحَاتِ أَلَّتِي تُصِيبُهَ that those things that he may dislike that he is afflicted with وَمِحْنَ أَلَّتِي تُنزِلُ بِي And the calamity that he is stricken with فِيهَا ضَرُوبٌ مِنْ مَصَالِحْ وَالْمَنَافِعِ That in it there is maslaha Something that is good for him And of benefit to him طيب وَلَا يُحْسِيهَا عِلْمُهُ وَلَا فِكْرَتُهُ And بَلْ مَسْلَةُ الْعَبْدِ فِيمَ يَقْرَهُ أَعْظَمْ مِنْ فِيمَ يُحِبْ And the reward that comes from his numerous And the goodness that comes to his slave is far greater in the path of that which he dislikes than that which he loves. So things that he dislikes and is afflicted with, and he remains patient with that, is far greater and more beneficial to him than the things that he may love. So the khulasa is, my brothers and my sisters, we all ourselves may face hardship and sadness and a form of depression and hurt in our hearts or even our loved ones but we need to utilize these principles this is the mindset that we have to have anything that we face خلاص, these principles go into effect this is our mindset this is how we should think nothing is for us anything that is given and that we have is only rahmah from Allah only rahmah from Allah and our actions and our thinking and our iman and how we react to certain things will be a decider of will we be bliss, will we be rewarded in the calamity that we are facing or are we only going to make things worse for ourselves and unfortunately many are failing, many of us are failing but when we get hit by something we fall even lower because we don't deal with the right way, our iman is so low and sometimes when we indulge, it could be because of our own sins. And we are in such depth of low iman that we can't even get ourselves up to fight. And we're just digging and digging our graves even more. And if the mercy of Allah does not come upon us, what we'll face in the akhirah will be far severe. So we lose out here and we lose out in the akhirah. So we can only beg Allah to keep us firm. And to cure us and cure our sick ones from the sickness of sadness and anxiety and depression. And may we be firm, alhamdulillah, and be of those, alhamdulillah, that will taste the sweetness of the hereafter. Ameen. Even if it's at the cost of tasting bitterness in this life. May Allah keep us firm. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet him in a state that he is pleased with us. Ameen. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم جزاكم الله خيرا في your patience بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله the proceeding has been a presentation of al مكتبة السلفية and salafibookstore dot com وجزاكم الله خير
وبارك الله فيكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته